We have a guest from Ishgard who wishes to speak with you. I believe the two of you have met. We have. I had hoped to speak with Commander Leveilleur as well, but I cannot afford to wait any longer. The Lord Commander sent me hither to request your aid in a matter of grave import. You see now why I had Tataru summon you. Now that we're all assembled, perhaps you would be good enough to elaborate on the nature of the matter which brought you to us. The Observatorium's astrologians have sounded the alarm. Last night, the Dragon Star burned with an intensity not seen in 15 summers. Not since the Dravanians engaged the Empire in the Battle of Silvertear Skies. Hmm. The northern sky doth burn full bright upon the Worm Lord's call. The red behemoth beckoneth, and flame consumeth all. The old Curthen Rhyme, I. The brightening of the dragon star is said to accompany the roar of a great worm. The astrologians believe that it was Midgard Soma himself who cried out on this occasion. After an absence of centuries, the King of Kings did return to lead his kind against the might of Garlemald. Only to fall in his duel with the Agrius, proud flagship of the Galian fleet. Devoid of life, his corpse remaineth entwined about the Magitek monstrosity even unto this day. Ariange has the right of it. Whatever this alteration in the Dragon Star portends, the Great Worm has shown no sign of life. Tataru, have the Domans reported aught out of the ordinary? Correct me if I'm wrong, but if Midgard Zorma had roared, wouldn't we have heard it here in Revenant's Toll? Roar is but a figure of speech. Dravanians can communicate in ways beyond our kin. It is for this very reason that we are forced to look for signs in the heavens. We cannot say with any confidence that a great worm roared at all, much less that it was Midgard Sorma. Only by directly examining the Keeper of the Lake can we be certain. However, it will take too long to gain the Holy See's approval to dispatch the Temple Knights. Therefore, Sir Emric would entrust this task to you. Do you accept? We knew you would not disappoint us. Now, if you would excuse me, I must return and assist the Lord Commander. We have precious little time to prepare. To prepare for what, pray tell? When a great worm roars, his brethren cannot choose but answer. We prepare for battle.
Who treadeth now upon my bones, and waketh me from slumber sweet?
By her gifts hast thou earned a moment's reprieve. me an oath breaker. Thou art mistaken. If thou comest to harm, it shall be by another's hand, not mine. Strip thee of thy mistress's feeble blessing. Thou 
didst profit much by her grace, but no more.
friend. I can scarce believe it. You confronted the Worm Lord and lived to tell the tale. I give thanks to Helone for your preservation. It is our sole cause for gladness. Your encounter with the Keeper of the Lake served to confirm our fears. A great worm has roared, and it makes little difference if it was one of the two in Eorzea, or any other. The Dravanians are coming. I am told that Ishgard has magical defenses against Dravanian attack, though I am not privy to their exact nature. Will they be enough to repel a massive force? Ishgard has weathered countless assaults over centuries. This will be no different. And now that you have confirmed the threat, none can ignore the Lord Commander's calls for the wards to be strengthened. I dare not presume to speak for him, but I expect the Lord Commander would sing your praises. I must away, but we shall meet again soon. Countless assaults weathered, and this will be no different? Why am I not convinced? Now that everything's calmed down a bit, relatively speaking, I mean, I thought it might be a good time to share our progress on the weapon. I believe we're on the verge of a breakthrough. Well, don't keep us all in suspense. Just in case anyone's forgotten, let's start by reviewing what we already know. So. An Asian is an immortal because its soul doesn't return to the ethereal realm when its host is defeated. Instead, it flees to the place that lies between our world and the Void. Therefore, the first step to permanently defeating an Asian is preventing its soul from making this journey. And if you recall, when we last gathered here, I had verified that White Aurasite has adequate capacity to entrap the beings, albeit only briefly. ...which left the small matter of their extermination. Aye. To unmake an Asian soul, one must needs smite it with a concentrated burst, or blade, of purest ether. However, we wanted for both the data and the means to forge such a weapon. Short of experimenting on an actual Asian, you see, there's no way to gauge how much ether its soul is made of. 
As such, we don't know what etheric density our blade needs to have in order for it to work. So we'll just have to make the densest blade we can and hope for the best. Though, that would require a lot of ether. Hang on a minute! Why didn't we think of this before? White Aurasite can hold an absolute heap of ether, can't it? Please tell me you're joking. God's sakes, Ida. I feel as though I'm reliving the same scene over and over with you. How many times do you need to be told that White Aurasite cannot store ether for long periods? Being intangible matter, ether is given to dispersion. Only in its crystallized form is it a stable source of energy. I will test you later on this, so see to it you do not forget! Uh, right, yes. It's all coming back to me. So our hopes rest on good old crystals again, do they? While they are certainly reliable, they leave something to be desired in the area of portability. Indeed. I am reminded of the quantity of corrupted crystals required to thwart Leviathan, and the extraordinary lengths to which the Lamentsons went to transport them. What if it should prove that a similar quantity was needed to destroy an Asian soul, or still more? I do not envy the poor saw to us to lug all of that around, on the off chance that an Asian appears. That's the very problem we set out to solve, and I reckon we've found the answer. If it isn't practical to lug around the ether we need, we'll just have to draw upon another source. And the only viable source is the land. If you mean to tap the Great River of Ether, know that it will entail considerable risk. Meddling with the currents may well induce a surge like to the one which despoiled Mordona. Give me a bit more credit, will you? Why would we need to tap the river when there are veritable reservoirs jutting out all over the land? Aye, I speak of corrupted crystals. It might be that their aspect is out of balance, but a crystal's a crystal. It contains ether, and we can help ourselves to it. While corrupted crystals are indeed abundant, there is no guarantee that they will be in close proximity at a crucial moment. But, what if we don't need them to be? What if we could tap their power from afar? A uh, malm away, say? If we could do that, we'd have ready access to ether aplenty in almost every corner of Eorzea. I've yet to put my theories to the proof, but I've got a good feeling about this. If no one has any objections, I'd like to see where this avenue leads. If you think it worth your while, you have my blessing. But tell us, what are your theories? I, for one, am most eager to understand the process, however vaguely. I thought you might say that, but no one wants to listen to boring old theories all day, do they? I know I don't. So with your permission, I'd like to try something a bit more hands-on. I've already built an etheric siphon especially for this purpose, and I've been meaning to try it out. Thing is, the profusion of corrupted crystals in Mordona makes it something of a high-risk testing ground. If anything goes awry with the siphon, it would be better if it didn't happen within spitting distance of quite so much ether. Ideally, I need an isolated specimen. Does anyone know where I can find one? May I suggest Northern Thanalan? There you will find corrupted crystals of middling size, standing a reasonable distance apart. Ideal for your needs, I should have thought. Oh, and if you do elect to visit the place, I should be much obliged if you would assist me in another matter while you are in the area. Has something happened? Movement has been observed at Castrum Meridianum. During Operation Archon, the Alliance dealt the stronghold a heavy blow. Its facilities were extensively damaged, and its garrison reduced to a fraction of its former strength. Not long after our forces withdrew, however, their ranks were replenished by reinforcements from Castrum Sentry. They now seek to rebuild, 
And to this end, they have their sights set upon the Ceruleum Processing Plant. Having lost the Empire's support, the 14th Legion lacks the resources to sustain itself. To them, this is a bid for survival, and they will doubtless fight like desperate men. Though I have dispatched the Crystal Braves, I fear their strength alone may not suffice to stay the Imperial assault. I would request the Scion's aid in the defensive effort. If I didn't know better, I'd say you were trying to inveigle us into fighting your battle with the promise of shiny crystals. Well then, consider me inveigled. I won't lie, the crystals you speak of sound perfect, so the Garleans have to go. Besides, we can't afford to beat about the bush. There's no telling when the Arsians will next appear. Thine eagerness to hurl thyself into the jaws of danger cometh as little surprise. Exercise due caution, I prithee. Though you have become a crystal brave, you are yet a scion, Alfino. We could hardly refuse you. Pray, join the crystal braves and lend them your support. Thangrid and Papa Limo shall accompany you. Ida and Yashtola, in the meantime, I would have you assist Moon Breeder. Scout out the crystal clusters, that the testing may commence as soon as the Galian threat has been eliminated. If it please you, I shall continue mine own experiments on white orosite. Thank you, Arianger. Everyone, pray see to your preparations and depart as soon as you're able. Go well, and be safe.
Hold on, I won't be a second. The beast seemed peckish, so I gave it a taste of my axe. I know, I know. As Orianger never tires of reminding me, an axe ill becometh the hand of a scholar. <sighs> what can I say? I like axes. To hear my mother tell it, I came into this world holding one. And it's not as if it stopped me picking up a quill, is it? <laughs> I often think of the man who introduced me to the joys of learning. He's one of the reasons I decided to come to Eorzea. Him and my excruciatingly stiff childhood friend. Considering how unalike we are, it's a wonder we ever got on. <laughs> the world's a strange old place, isn't it? Aye, that ought to do it. So far, so good. At these concentrations, it shouldn't matter too much if something goes awry. Just enough ether to make it interesting. Did you see that? The way the crystal glowed? The siphon works, I'm happy to say. With a few refinements, it should satisfy our appetite for ether. Which just leaves the small matter of forging our blade. I'm not sure how to go about it just yet. But I swear to find a way. I'll put a blade in your hands if it's the last thing I do. She senses me. A useful talent. Panassian, are they on to us? By your brand, I see you are an Archon of Charlian. Keeper of knowledge, seeker of truth, meddler. I don't know what the hell's you're saying, but I don't much like your tone. <laughs> your instincts serve you well. But come, be not unsettled on my account. That lovely brow was not made for frowns. Ah, uh, but I waste my breath. Let me direct my words to one who understands them. We meet at last, warrior of light. I am Nabrialis. And you have long been a thorn in my side. I suffered the overweening presence of Lahabrea that men might host the power of gods, only for you to undo my hard work. Oh, bugger. Do settle down. You must concede that I acted in self-defense. But what's this? I do not sense the blessing of light. Oh, dear. Could it be that frail Heidlin has forgotten her champion? This I did not foresee. Shorn of light as you are, you are no longer a threat. And better yet, the seal is broken. Now is the time to claim the staff. With it in my grasp, I shall rise above them all and take my place at Lord Zodiac's right hand. What did that bastard want with us? Nobriolus, he calls himself. <laughs> with charm like that, I'll bet he has maidens falling at his feet. Unconscious. But this staff... You say just talking about it had the bastard grinning like a brat on his name day. <laughs> Must be quite a staff. Oh, gods. He means Tupsimati, Master Louis Soir's staff. Minfilia's in danger. 
We have to get back to the Rising Stones. You too. So, you were able to divine my intent. What now, warrior of light? Ah, but that name is no longer fitting. You have become decidedly dull and quite incapable of barring my entry. What do you mean? You truly do not know. Then I suppose it is only right that I enlighten you. The blessing of light kept you and your fellow meddlers safe. It was that which prevented my kind from entering your domain. My kind, I say, though it had no power over the likes of Elidibus and La Habrea. Being of this world, they could come and go as they please, while I could only look on. But I need look no longer. Now that the seal is gone, I mean to act. Unlike the others, I am not given to waiting. I shall take that staff and bring about the next rejoining. Rejoining? Then it was your doing! The Isle of Val, the Scholars, all of it! You will not harm her! Why must you insist on forcing my hand? Did you learn nothing from our last meeting? Ah, but I forget. My words fall upon deaf ears. The staff is but a broken relic. A memorial to the departed. What possible use could you have for it? What use? You mean to say that all this time you kept the key, never knowing what it was you possessed? The Staff Tupsimati, or rather the stone tablet it bears, is host to a great power. Together with the Horn, it can be used to draw vast quantities of ether from its bearer's surroundings. How else do you think Louis Soi was able to invoke the power of the Twelve without making them an offering of crystals? Summoning requires not only prayer, but a profusion of ether. Even a child knows that. If I did not know before, you may be certain I do now. But above all, I know that we cannot allow this staff to fall into your hands. I will die before I let you take it. Insufferable woman. I would happily end your miserable life here and now. Alas, Elidibus would never let me hear the end of it. Very well. 
If you will not part with the staff, I will take you too. To them quickly before the rift closes.
you're safe. Thank the Twelve. You may have bested me this day, but what of the next? What of all the days to come? Remember, light no longer holds sway here. I may return whensoever I wish, again and again and again. Eventually, you will falter, and the staff will be mine. Until next time, Scions. There will be no next time. This is the end. Trickery is this. No, no, cannot. No. Use Tube Samati to gather ether quickly before he breaks free. Concentrate. Call to mind the time you struck down La Habrea with the Blade of Light. Why won't it work? Is it because we lack the blessing of light? Damn it. So much ether. And it still isn't enough. Fools! No mortal prison can contain me! I shall make you pay for your insolence! Please! Mother Heidelin! Hearken to our plea! Lend us your divine light! Can you not hear us? Do our words no longer reach you? If only we had a bit more ether. Moonbreeder, what are you doing? Master Louisois, I understand now the choice you made. In death, there is life. Farewell, Uriange. You daft old coat. No! You mustn't! What? No! It, it 
cannot end. I am eternal. I am immortal. Moon Breeder. She's... she's gone. You did it, my friend. The Asian is dead. This device is a legacy of Moonbreeder's toils and sacrifice. I shall hold on to it for safekeeping. Minfilia, uh, are you all right? I am. Oh, we were surveying Northern Thanalan when we received the distress call. We returned as swiftly as we were able. It seems you have everything in hand, however. What happened here? Where is Moonbreeder? She gave her life to temper the Blade of Light. I... I have no words. Rather than await the inevitable, she took her fate into her own hands. Does... does Arianje know? My friend, there is something I must tell you. I heard all, my lady. The moon sinketh, taking her leave of the heavens, yet her passing heraldeth the coming of a new day. <laughs> Moonbreeder hath fulfilled her destiny, hath she not? Long ago, far across the seas in the Charlean motherland, Moonbreeder and I did study under the sage tutelage of Master Louis Soi. Full off did he impress upon us that knowledge existeth to serve the greater good. This sentiment, however, was contrary to the nation's policy of neutrality, which censured intercedence in the affairs of foreign lands. In spite of vehement opposition, he founded the Circle of Knowing, and journeyed hitherto the heart of Eorzea. Through his noble sacrifice was the realm spared its doom. Yet this great soul, whom all should rightly have honored, was branded a pariah in his own land. His peers did accuse him of forsaking his duty as a man of learning, and of meddling in the course of history. When he left Charleon behind, Master Louis Soir gave no word to signal his intent to Moonbreeder. Close as they were, as master and disciple, she was deeply wounded by the sudden exclusion from his confidence. Above all, however, she was confused. Try as she might, she could ill comprehend her master's motive. The slanders that were heaped upon him after his passing served only to inflame the turmoil within her. For years upon end, she knew not what to believe. Torn as she was, twixt the man whom she revered and the man who forsook her and his duty both. The Louis Soir I knew would never forsake his duty, much less one of his own. This I know full well, my lady. 
'Twas not for want of love that Master Louis Soi hid his intent. He but desired that Moonbreeder discover her own path, free of the shadow of his influence. Long did I contemplate revealing the truth to her, and long did I hold my peace. After all, was it not Master Louis Soi's wish that she come to the truth unaided? Uh, I told myself it was, and resolved to let her suffer. Knowingly did I deny my friend the comfort she craved. And now she hath gone to her rest, with doubt still in her heart. Speakest thou in earnest? Did Moonbreeder truly come to understand Master Louis Soir's will before the end? Uh, the realization hath set her free. She may now find the peace which hath for so long eluded her. Oh, Moonbreeder, my dearest, how I shall miss thee. Moonbreda gave her life that we might possess the means to defeat the Asians. Her sacrifice must not be in vain. Let us continue her work on the Blade of Aether and see it to completion. My lady, I would mourn Moonbreda in mine own way. I beg your permission to return to the Waking Sand. Of course, my friend. Take all the time you require. We shall be here should you have need of us. <laughs>